Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So let us continue uh, to talk uh, for few more minutes uh, regarding the layouts of various plants and the facilities uh, that we have in the country. Uh, as I, I have pointed out already that we have a very strong uh, secondary steel producer as well as uh, primary steel producers. Uh, we have both integrated and mini mills uh, and uh, mini steel plants we have uh, basically induction furnace based and arc furnace uh, based. Arc furnace based facilities which are uh, basically DRI oriented or DRI based, they have both come up in the western India, because you know that we have gas based DRI production units as well as coal based DRI production units. Uh, you have midrex process which is a gas based process, uh, then we have uh, SLRN or rotary clean process which is a coal based process. So, mostly in eastern India we have uh, coal based DRI units good number of uh, you know, DRI plants with uh, you know, not much infrastructure, uh, they are just the money making units actually, uh, nothing beyond that gross violation of environmental norms, uh, these have come up uh, in the eastern coast. On the other hand, we have uh, the gas fired uh, or gas based DRI processes mostly located in the western India, because of the availability of natural gas there. Uh, it is also understood as I have pointed out that if India has to grow, uh, uh, India has to develop, it will need steel and perhaps from that point of view 180 million ton by 2020 is not too uh, massive a figure. And it is also certain uh, that because of the logistic problems, uh, because of less capital inflow, because of problems with land acquisition, uh, infrastructure etcetera, uh, perhaps we will witness in the years to come, uh, you know, more or less similar rate of growth in the primary as well as in the among the primary between the primary and the secondary steel producers. So we will see parallel growth of the integrated steel mills as well as mini mills uh, in the country. And of late, you know, many steel plants uh, are being launched, which has a capacity between one million ton to two million tons. Uh, you know, Balaji go, Balaji Group, then Sham Group, um, Bhushan Groups. Uh, Bhushan group is also expanding and there are humpty number of steel plants which uh, are planned to be coming up uh, in the eastern coast, particularly in Odisha, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh area. Now, having said so, uh, we understand that uh, the primary steel producers in this country. Uh, they are going to be using mostly uh, LD steel making process. Uh, they in the future uh, developments, we may see in integrated mills coming up with thin slab casting or maybe strip casting, uh, it is not yet certain, because strip casting is now a proven technology. And uh, I heard that SR, SR steel is already negotiating with Nucor, which is uh, one of the pioneers in strip casting technology for setting up of plants. And today, I think I have mentioned during the course of this course that we have continuous strip production technology, uh, which is you know uh, economically and energetically extremely efficient. Uh, so, newer technologies we will gradually see getting into the Indian market uh, as well. Subtle variations do exist as I have mentioned yesterday regarding the steel making technology, subtle variations also exist. Uh, in terms of you know level size, stun dish capacity, uh, nature of products, uh, nature of secondary treatment, types of vacuum degassing treatment. Some plants use tank degassing techniques, some plants use circulation degassing techniques. So, although the subtle variations are there, uh, the process route uh, more or less is the same in all integrated steel plants and in the foreseeable future. I do not think 
it is going to change by and large. So, we will have a primary steel making followed by lucid secondary steel making, but the emphasis on secondary steel making is going to grow more and more in the years to come as we put in more and more stringent requirements on the quality of steel. And finally, we have casting technology. Ingot casting has also been completely phased out. Sale, of course, will not be growing. Uh, we have to see what happens to the sale plans in the year to come. Uh, you know, with uh, national uh, uh, you know orientation changing a little bit, and we are thinking more in terms of these investments. Uh, you know, maybe some of the sale plan plants, uh, you know, may go out of the sale umbrella in the years, uh, and that we have to really watch. But at this moment, at least no new sale plants, no new RINL ventures are likely in the horizon. It is mostly uh, the private sectors, uh, Indels, Mittels, uh, the Ruyas of the, the SR group, etcetera, they are uh, actually planning to set up more and more integrated steel mills. But so far as mini steel plants are concerned, there are you know so many groups. Uh, Mesco is another group uh, which is uh, you know, trying to expand. So, uh, so these are not so famous industrial houses, but we will see such ventures coming up all over India, South India, Eastern India, but maybe primarily, you know, it is the developments are going to be taking place uh, either in the Western India because of the availability of cheap fuel or in Western India where we have abundant uh, low grade coal available to us. Now, if we have to get to the figure of 180 million ton by 2020 from 55 million tons 2009. Yeah. We have to uh, see that is it sort of a daydreaming, uh, is it or is it possible for us to achieve. And in view of that, uh, I think we have to now uh, understand that you know the, the GDP is very high, so maybe the we are in a position, uh, you know, provided government makes land available, you know, the market can generate lot of cash, uh, and uh, you know we should be in a position to gear up our steel making facilities. But the issue comes now that what are the problems? That we need to understand. So. The problems, you know, this journey is not going to be so easy, uh, despite the, you know, growing economy, despite the demand for a large amount of steel, I do not think uh, it is going to be an easy journey, because we have a lot of problems, and I envisage the problems, or I tend to list the problems, one is our raw material problem. problem, and other is our operational Yesterday, I have tried to briefly, in the last lecture, I have tried to uh, briefly mention that, uh, you know, we have an excellent iron ore, uh, we, you know, and the amount of reserve is also pretty good, and we have good amount of coke also, but our coke is laced with large amount of coke ash, uh, you know, 22, 25, 28 percentage. And what is coke ash? The coke ash basically is silica, alumina, etcetera and you know, it contains lot of sulphurs as well. So, iron ore is basically, we have lot of fixed iron is very good, uh, one of the finest iron ore from that point of view, but at the same time, uh, our iron ore contains lot of silica and uh, alumina. We know that uh, silica uh, can be reduced in the blast furnace. So, therefore, uh, you know, the tendency to produce a high silicon peak iron in Indian blast furnace is uh, somewhat relatively high. And this, uh, this, this off, tends to offset uh, the good quality of iron ore. So, some beneficiation seems to be, you know, particularly when we will be talking about uh, low grade processing of low grade iron ores, because not all grades of iron ores, uh, the iron ore reserve is of 60 or 65 percentage iron. So, there are low grades iron also, and then the beneficiation uh, of iron ore, particularly 
you know, removing silica, etcetera, is going to be meaning, meaningful. So, if you have more silica in the relatively more silica and you have, you know, one is to one proportion roughly alumina. So, the alumina will invariably go to the slack phase. So, you are forced to use a, a maintain a very high heart temperature and that high heart temperature what it does? It causes uh, thermodynamically more favorable, uh, creates more favorable condition for the production of high silicon peak iron. And this high silicon peak iron upsets the economics of steel making as we all know, because high silicon peak iron means we have large amount of heat produced in LD converter, uh, we have large volume of slag. If you have large volume of slag, then we have large CO, large amount of CO to be added. If you have large amount of heat, which is evolved in the LD reactor, then the lining life is going to be drastically affected. So, so high silicon peak iron, it has problem and alternatively, if you do not wish to take that to the LD converter, you have an external desiliconization that is again, you know, deterrent to the production of the steel, because of the simple fact that external desiliconization will consume some amount of time and, uh, you know, uh, slow down the pace of steel production. Uh, ash, of course, is, uh, you know, is a, is a issue of concern to all of us and uh, our coke rate in the blast furnace, if you go back, uh, is also not quite encouraging, okay, we have to do, you know, because uh, the coke ash, the effect fixed amount, you know, fixed carbon in coke is going to be less, more and more is the uh, coke ash and that is why uh, our co, you know, coke rate in our Indian blast furnaces ranges 700, 800 kgs per ton of hot metal produced, because we are charging less fixed carbon and more ash possibly, which is reflected in the high figure of uh, coke rate for blast furnaces, etcetera. And again, we have, we are talking of, you know, more slag, more coke ash means uh, the process more coke essentially implies that, you know, the process is environmentally less friendly we are producing more greenhouse gases and uh, finally, uh, you know, it will have large amount of uh, slag which will be produced because silica, alumina which are present in coke ash needs to be flushed and as a result of which you have a downstream problem of waste disposal. Okay. So, these are, you know, some issues. So, as we go on to 180 million tons, okay, so the waste generated are also going to be much, much more and we have to see that when there is so much of crunch on the land, how do you really distribute or manage the waste which is generated out of the steel plant. Of more importance to me is the operational problems in the Indian steel plants. I mean, the technology uh, in the Indian steel plants is very, very old and uh, particularly, you know, I have mentioned uh, in the previous lecture that electric arc furnaces if you go and see and these are 40, 50 years of old and so many developments have taken place in the arena of steel technology, it is a, it is just unbelievable, un, uncountable and if you go to the Indian steel plants, you will see uh, that, you know, the technology has taken a back seat there, where uh, the owners are more concerned with the number of heats, uh, you know, amount of liquid metal without bothering much about, uh, you know, the general safety, um, the energy efficiency. Uh, the uh, cleanliness in the plant itself and these have been issues, these are issues which have been totally ignored in the plant. So, there are a lot of operational problems and this operational problems, uh, I think I will say that leads to, uh, we have, you know, we, we, number one is, uh, we can say that we have high, or first one I will say that age old technology. I am not saying each and every plant in India, you know, uses old technology, but by and large my experience has been that, uh, you know, for example, one simple last thing I am going to tell you is that, if you, if you visit Indian steel plants, most of the places you will see that uh, ladles and tandish, they are operated. Uh, with stopper rods and uh, in no steel plants, no modern steel plants, if you go, you go and visit for example, Chinese, uh, Japanese steel plant, Korean steel plant, POSCO, etcetera, nowhere you will find they are using stopper rod. Stopper rod, you remember, this is to regulate the flow out of the tandish, regulate the flow out of the ladle. Okay? So, they are uh, steel 
persistently used in many many Indian steel plants, but you know uh, copper rod technology has been phased out from literally phased out from modern steel plants, where we are now using slide bit uh, technology. Okay, so this is just one uh, single uh, you know example. Then we have, as a result of high you know age old technology, we have lot of problems uh, in the plant and therefore, we have and the layout of the plant is also not scientific. These have housekeeping is extremely poor. We have emission, recovery, these are big issues in Indian plants. We have high specific energy consumption. We have poor post process control. These are all important issues. Layouts of the plant, for example, I have told, talked about little bit about age old technology. Layout of plant not scientific. Many of the steel plants we will see because they are age old. Uh, you know, there is no synchronization of activities. For example, uh, you will see that the furnace is here, the furnace is here, for example, and the material is tapped here in a little, and then it goes like this, and we have an elapsed And again, the material is brought here. We have casting. So, you know, there is lifting by cranes. So, the you know sometimes they move on rail, sometimes they are lifted from one place to another place. So, the electric arc furnace, then it is tapped, it moves in one direction and then it goes to the LF or VD station, then it moves in the reverse direction, because the plant is not scientifically laid out and you know this creates lot of logistic problems in running uh, the operation uh, very smoothly. So, and even if you look at the overall layout you know the scrap yard is at one corner, uh, uh, the, the control room is you know uh, control rooms are not properly located, uh, control equipments are not functioning uh, properly and these all creates a uh, lot of uh, problem in, in terms of managing uh, you know the available resources very efficiently. The plant layouts are in general except for few modern plants and this I am more or less I am, I am talking about mostly the mini steel plants or the arc furnace based steel plants, okay, where it is an extremely primitive uh, layout is there in the plant. And what happens is for example, if layout is not scientific in that case what happens is for example, you try to process steel through this and at one point of time you find that because of transportation etcetera holding your temperature has dropped to such a level that you require really reheating uh, in, uh, in the LF. So, you have to shuttle between LF. Uh, time and again in order to bring it, uh, bring the metal under the correct temperature in the continuous casting loop. Housekeeping for example, is extremely important. Why? For example, in most of the steel plants if you go, you will find that it is smoke, dust, the cleanliness level is very, very bad. Now, if the housekeeping is no good, in that case it is very difficult to attract new engineers and asking them uh, to make their career in steel plants. Because 
I have been visiting many steel plants and I have been telling people that unless you are able to create a congenial atmosphere, unless the environment in your steel plant is good, no engineers from NIT and IIT are going to make a career in the Indian steel plant. So, this is extremely important. If you see outside steel plants, they are so clean. Many of you may have seen videos, okay? And you know there are few people, and of course this brings me one: too many man hands. The workforce is too large in our steel plant, okay? So house coming back to the housekeeping, uh, we require, you know, it should look like a modern steel plants, modern steel plant, extremely clean, very little amount of. Uh, gases uh, and dusts or smokes uh, and you know you, you go to steel plants you find scrap is everywhere dirt is everywhere broken pieces are everywhere and you don't feel like what they are at all and if that is the scenario in that case you know it'll, it'll, this is going to cut a very sorry figure as far as new recruitments are concerned and it projects on the other hand many people have you know foreign, foreign countries have come Seen Indian steel plants, they have interacted with me on diverse fronts and have told me Indian steel plants are 50 years behind in terms of all these things. Emission recovery, emission is rampant emissions in Indian steel plants. If you go, you will see that they are all red powders everywhere, there is dust, and if you go to the ELAP station, you go to the electric furnace, uh, during the furnace stepping everywhere, there is so much of smoke and dust that it becomes horribly difficult, uh, you know. Uh, to work um, efficiently under such conditions. And these are certain us, you know, we have extremely G GCP, gas cleaning plants. Okay. Many places, many a times I have seen the gas cleaning plants, which are essentially attached to the LD converter, electric furnace, level furnace, etcetera, are not at all functioning. And you know, the dust, etcetera, from these furnaces are being released to the environment in a uh, callous manner. Uh, again, Recovery of heat from the spent gases is also a very important issue, which you have not been able to give sufficient attention. Uh, and all these things, layout of the plant, age old technology, emission recovery, let us ultimately high specific energy consumption. Poor process control. In many of the plants, I have seen that they do not have, for example, flow meters, which can record the amount of the flow oxygen going into the furnace itself and as a result of which they tend to overblow oxygen. And if the blow overblow, in that case the slag becomes more and more richer in iron oxide. Sometimes it is 25 percent, sometimes it is 35 percent with excessive amount of oxygen blown. And if 35 percent of your you know iron slag contains so much of iron oxide, in that case you can imagine what is going to happen to your yield. So, therefore, process, process control Good adequate process control is necessary. For that, you will have to have sensors and gadgets. PLC to be functioning all the time. They should be giving you good and reasonable results. And finally, um, you know, we have too many, too many hands. Of course, we are, uh, you know. I mean, we have to look at the society. Uh, but even China, which is a socialist uh, country, uh, you know, there the number of hands per ton of steel produced is far less. Uh, then ours, in our steel plants, we just have too many people. The liability on the management is also high in terms of their healthcare cost, you know, uh, and other recurring costs, and as a result of which the profit really is not that much. Many of the steel plants, you see that they, they are in India, they make enormous amount of profit. Uh, it is because of one single fact that it is not because of technology, it is not because of you know very efficient management, uh, but it is because of one single fact that they have. Uh, captive mines and from captive mines they are able to get uh, you know the basic raw materials at an excessively cheap price okay and that gives them the edge uh, over others so plants which are operating in india yeah, there are few, many of them i don't want to name them here okay they have their captive mines and from that captive mines they get um, you know raw materials at a very cheap rate and as a result of which the final product they roll out uh, is uh, really extremely you know, low price, uh, relatively low price with respect uh, to others. Now, having said so much, uh, the other important issue uh, is that uh, what we have recently seen uh, uh, is an issue of manpower. So, 
raw material problem, operational problem and then we have manpower problem. This is a very important thing. And in this context, uh, I wish to spend a few more minutes on the topic of steel education and research in India. Now, if you, when you have so much of steel produced, so many new steel plants coming up, we will certainly require uh, metallurgical engineers, uh, particularly people having interest in steel making. Uh, we possibly will not be you know hiring graduates from Chinese to run our steel plants. So, we require qualified manpower, we require people who have a lot of interest uh, in steel making. Now, we have a, as you are aware that we have a full fledged ministry of steel and mines that uh, you know takes care uh, or controls uh, all steel related and mines related activities. We have a cabinet minister. We also have MHRD which Ministry of Human Resource and Development which looks after uh, the overall you know um, higher education as well as education uh, in this country. Now, recently uh, under the ages of the ministry, we have Indian Institute of Metals, this is not Indian Institute of Management, but Indian Institute of Metals, the headquarter is in Calcutta. So, with the intervention from MOS, IIM has constituted a committee or Ministry of Steel asked IIM to constitute a committee to look into the issue of manpower shortage in steel plants. Remarkably speaking, I have seen that uh, in, in one month, there is a unique example, I could locate one single person working in three different steel plants. He was first working in X, then after 20 days, I visited another plant and I found that the plant person has moved to the second, you know another steel plant why and then finally by the month end he has moved to another steel plant because he was getting more salary there are not takers and as a result of which what happens is it is the same person who goes from one plant to another plant and at the grassroots level or at the graduate training level we have not been able to recruit too many people you know, for our steel plants because of the simple fact that we do not roll out that many engineers today uh, who has requisite expertise and knowledge of steel making and also on the part of the students uh, as you are aware that students do not show much interest uh, to make a career in steel, steel because it is not as attractive as nano material, it is not as attractive as bio material, it is not as attractive as uh, infotech, uh, but maybe it is an age old field and uh, also you know the plant conditions etcetera uh, have been deterrent uh, for the students for to make up uh, to take up. Uh, a position in the steel plant. So, we have you know although so much of proliferation of education has gone under the ages of the ministry of you know, uh, human resource and development, we have so many uh, dimmed universities coming up, so many engineering institutions coming up. Remarkably speaking, uh, you know uh, there are very few you can just count them in fingers in the last five years engineering universities or institutions have opened which have uh, metallurgical engineering as a discipline. I think last five years I remember there are um, one in Orissa, uh, then in IIT Bhopal has started a program in metallurgical and materials engineering and also we you may have noticed that earlier while uh, the education is uh, basically uh, metallurgy oriented say 30, 40 years back today uh, the orientation uh, in most of the engineering colleges are uh, materials oriented. Earlier we used to be taught uh, th uh, metallurgical thermodynamics, today the thermodynamics course is re restructured as thermodynamic of thermodynamics of materials where you know more thrust is given to defect thermodynamics, uh, chemical thermodynamics, gibbs duham equation, Lingham diagram etcetera have possibly you know been kept aside uh, to some extent and uh, as a steel maker you know our, our we would like to see that you know there is the emphasis on chemical thermodynamics, there is emphasis 
on uh, thermodynamic chemical thermodynamic software and so on so that the people can engineers can carry out a uh, small or relevant calculations on a daily basis so the curriculum has also gradually drifted uh, towards uh, the materials science uh, there have been new areas which are coming up emerging areas uh, and because of and thirdly we have too few institutions catering to the needs of the material metallurgical and materials engineering and you know statistics is almost 1000 to 1200 metallurgical engineering graduates are produced in a country like ours and although steel plants uh, you know have lot of job openings lot of vacancies uh, they do not find employable graduates at the end of the day so these three problems that too few metallurgical engineering graduates and passing out and then we have uh, metallurgical you know engineering um, uh, curriculum which is uh, lopsided getting lopsided towards uh, materials education and also um, you know emerging areas uh, these three have really uh, put a punch uh, on steel makers ability to recruit more and more people so the task force uh, now mostly comprises of bsc graduates diploma holders who are given some training rather than be metallurgy or graduates in metallurgical engineering because that you know too many uh, number of metallurgical engineering graduates uh, willing to work in a steel plant are not simply available so this is going to be a serious concern uh, for us in the years to come that uh, we do not have um, uh, you know too many uh, engineers and also uh, here i would like to blame the steel plants also to some extent they might recruit the metallurgical engineers for example uh, but the environment in the steel plants in this country is unfortunately not that creative uh, because the graduate engineers uh, you know uh, if he is recruited uh, we cannot expect him to just to press a red button and a blue button you know tap the heat and be content with it so he has to apply his mind and he needs a creative environment and steel plants who are who only think in terms of number of hits a day uh, unfortunately has not been able to give that creative atmosphere to the new recruits and as a result uh, you know young engineers going and working in the steel plants get really disillusioned uh, because they don't find much creativity uh, there there is not much scope of improvement uh, because the management does not nurture uh, excellence they just uh, look at uh, you know uh, the quantum of steel that is being produced so there are many issues it is not just it is a very complex problem uh, ministry of steel is there mhrd is there we should have by now you know and we saying that well we will need steel uh, by 2020 you know lot of steel and we should have been able to by now you know reinforce our steel education and research program in the country so that we have a smooth production i mean in most countries we have an iron and steel institute where is such an institute in this country okay we do need now you know maybe it is time has come that we have a separate institute which will roll out people with requisite qualifications in iron and steel technology who should be you know in a position uh, to take up the you know occupy the position of uh, graduate engineers and so on so despite a full fledged ministry of steel despite a ministry of human resources and development what i see that you know steel education in this country uh, has been ignored uh, for quite some time and today the number of graduates produced having interest in steel making you see this is a this is a really perpetual problem in the sense that uh, when i we were students uh, there are a lot of uh, seats of excellence and extractive metallurgy in this country or iron and steel technology be it iit bangalore be it iit kanpur iit kharagpur iit chennai iit Madra, iit bombay and lot of nits also but today uh, the number of experts the number of professors involved uh, in teaching and doing research in iron and steel has dwindled remarkably you can ask that why it is so important because when we have professors uh, teaching uh, and doing research in iron and steel it is they who induce uh, create the interest among the students okay it is they who you know supervise the graduate students and these graduate students at later stages become leader in their field so the professors have a proactive role here and unfortunately you know in the last 10 years or so 
the number of professors doing uh, research and teaching in steel making has reduced to an alarmingly low level. And my uh, quote of the day is like that, the steel making professor has become uh, like a, a panda. Panda is an animal, you know, and uh, I think uh, World Wildlife Organization has declared it to be an endangered species. And I think the professor of steel maker in this country has also um, uh, become an endangered species. Uh, and I think a very viable steel program, you know, uh, parallel to uh, the material science program is available only in Japan, which spends, you know, there are a lot of universities where there is steel research going on. There are people who take a lot of interest in steel making. And at the same time, uh, Japan is doing excellent in terms of, you know, electronics and other exotic and advanced uh, materials. But unfortunately, our vision has been sometimes uh, somewhat distorted, and as a result of which, you know, uh, the education program uh, has suffered tremendously. And I have been mentioning that it has its own uh, problems now, which we are going to see or experience in the years to come. Research in iron and steel, for example, indigenous research in iron and steel is very, very poor. Uh, you know, although we have uh, a full-fledged uh, research RDCS that is under sale has set up a huge research center, but we really have not been able to come up with a new technology. Many developmental works, yes, we have been able to do, we have been able to improve some of the existing processes, but not uh, new technology. So, look at from such point also, you know, we, we do not have a sizable or a meaningful R and D activities in steel in the country. We, I think Chinese in the, that front are doing uh, much greater, much be, better than us. A uh, lot of Indian steel plants today, uh, I go and see, they are buying, for example, Chinese technology. Chinese coke ovens are being installed in JSW, um, pulverized coal injection and blast furnace, entirely Chinese technology. But where is the equivalent Indian technology? We have not been able to come up that. And I think uh, we have faltered somewhere uh, down the line and that is why, you know, uh, the scenario, you know, although we have painted a rosy picture, but the scenario in terms of manpower, in terms of research, in terms of the general conditions of the plant really do not look that uh, attractive. So, uh, this is, uh, I think, the last lecture of this course and uh, now I have come to an, an end uh, and I do not wish to go beyond this. Uh, but uh, I think there is lot of challenge. The last statement that I am going to make uh, as far as uh, the discussion is concerned is that, uh, you know, we, 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 we require very knowledgeable people now to contribute in the area of steel making. Uh, I have mentioned earlier also that the technology is 150 years old. It is near perfect technology. So, you know, just by merely attending the shop floor or going on a daily basis, you will not be able to contribute. Your knowledge of the subject has to be very, very good. You have to be equipped with, you know, modern subjects, modern tools, knowledge of computer, knowledge of fluid mechanics, knowledge of kinetics, all these are necessary. And then possibly we can see that, well, you can improve the casting rate further, you can improve the yield further. We are already talking about 92, 94 percentage of yield in steel plants. So, it is a near perfect technology that we are dealing. But in our country, the mindset has to change. Uh, the owners and the government has to change their mindset and uh, product, for example, steel products. No, they are completely dirty products that we today produce. No? And these products and government is of course going to bring in some regulations. There is so much of so much of inclusion that really you cannot apply them in strategic application. Today it is fine, but if you put inclusion less steel, loaded steel for making bridges, you can imagine after 50 or 100 years down the time, you know, down the road, what is going to happen to the fate of all these things. So these are very important issues, and as a budding in you know steel making engineer. Uh, you should be concerned about it. My objective as well as Professor Korea's objective has in this course is to expose you to the subject, you know, give you a modern outlook and bring it, bring you to a point where you should be able to think yourself, uh, you know, uh, what are the ifs, ifs and buts, what is the subject, what are the loopholes, what are the problems, what are the scope and put everything in the perspective of India, because India has to grow, India has to develop and India will need more steel. Thank you.